Good morning and welcome to Living Water Church this morning. It is awesome that we get to talk about the word of the Lord and pray and that distance really can't stop the word of the Lord from moving forward. Right now all across the world thousands and thousands of videos are flooding the servers of YouTube and Vimeo and every other site. The word of God The glory of God is covering the sea of all the computer parts as we speak throughout the world. That being said, before we get into the message this morning, I want to break to go to the office, which has a few announcements for us, as well as our reading from one of the families of the church. Let's go there now. Good morning, everyone. I have the beautiful task of bringing forward our announcements this morning. Um, So things that you should be looking out for this week. One, the beacon. The beacon, we have a meal to serve at the end of this month, and we still need everything that we normally need. We need you serving the food. We need your donations of food. This week in the Splash, we sent out a sign-up sheet. So if you haven't checked that out, please go look. If you're interested in donating or serving, get on the Splash, get on that link, and sign up as soon as you can. Also, um, financial statements, our quarterly financial statements. Obviously, we're not seeing each other face-to-face, so we can't hand you any envelopes. So we'll be doing it electronically. So again, in the splash, um, Emily, who's our financial secretary, her email address is there. If you're interested in receiving your quarterly statements, please go to the splash um, and send um, Emily an email letting her know that you want to receive your statements electronically. Um, What else? Also... Every Wednesday from 12 to 1, I will be in the office, in the Zoom office. Um, I'll be available from 12 to 1 on Zoom. So if anyone wants to to do an office drop-in, I'll be there. You'll see my pretty face. And you can ask any questions, comments, whatever you have at the time. I'll be there to answer it for you. And if you haven't noticed, I've made several references to the splash. The splash is very, very important to just disseminating information and communicating with you guys um, on a weekly basis. So please, if you're um, on that list and you receive the splash, please open the emails and read the splash. I put so much time into it. Everyone who contributes to it would love for you to have that information um, right there for you to be able to access. So please check that out every single week. And if you haven't, Email me at questions at livingwaterflows.com and I will gladly put you on the list to receive the splash to get all this information. And last but not least, please subscribe uh, to our church YouTube page. Whenever we upload a new video, you'll be one of the first to see it. It'll come up on your page. Um, We just crossed the threshold of 100 subscribers this week. So yay! Um, But keep it up. Share our videos, subscribe to our video right underneath this video here. See you guys. Good morning, Living Water Church. This morning, we're starting with a reading from Psalm 31, verse 1. In you, Lord, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hand, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Deliver me. Lord, my faithful God. Psalms 31, 15 through 16. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Acts 2, 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and of prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. 
They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want to begin with a little bit of a discussion or story about Satya Nadella. I'm reading this book by him. He's the CEO of Microsoft and Windows and all of that. Of course, if you've studied the Microsoft story, it is just a story of exponential growth and competition and of users getting an opportunity of connecting online and all of that. That being said, of course, every company and every organization goes through some growing pains and even at times doesn't always make the right decision. And eventually, after Bill Gates and another CEO stepped aside, Satya Nadella was elected to be the CEO of Microsoft. And in this book, Hit Refresh, he talks about Microsoft's journey to rediscover their soul. What makes Microsoft great? And how can they rediscover that even as a company, which sometimes was known for its fierce competition, even internal to itself, different executives competing. And he wanted to bring a much more holistic, unified picture of what it means to live the technology life and be Microsoft and make great software for the world. And so this book talks about the rediscovery of their soul and of their priorities. And if you haven't checked lately, even during this time of coronavirus, all of us probably wish that we would have bought Microsoft stock back when they were having a few hiccups because they're still growing and they're still advancing right even during this strange time period. I tell that story not to talk about Microsoft, but rather to ask the same question of all those people listening to us today, mostly probably from Living Water Church, but perhaps beyond. What is the soul of God's church? What are the priorities of God's church? And maybe especially so in this time of COVID-19 and coronavirus. I've kind of been joking and calling it Coronageddon. No, I don't think it's the end of the world. I think we have much more to do for the Lord. Um, but nonetheless, what are the priorities of God's church? And in our passage today from the book of Acts, I think this lays out the regular practices of the church throughout the centuries. And I don't think this is something that we can lose. This is part of our soul. This is what makes us, us. This is what will make the church great both now and in however long it takes for us to get together once again. The first quality that makes a church's priorities or that is the church's priority is that we are a people of mission. We are a people of mission. For 2,000 years now, missionaries have been leaving their homes, friends and neighbors have been crossing the street, sharing the gospel from person to person in friendship and direct evangelism or in street preaching, which, by the way, really does work in a lot of other countries of the world, as well as in starting and founding churches and doing a ministry evangelism within the workplace and workplace ministry and representing Christ. We, people of God, are on a mission. Matthew 28 is so clear. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And then he tells his followers, therefore, go into all the world to preach the gospel to all creation. In other words, be the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Be the glory of God throughout the world. That is our role as God's people, to be on mission for him. And there is no virus that can stop the mission of God it only begins to illustrate how far our mission really can go and how we can innovate and bring that mission across the world still. Acts 2, our passage today, is right off the heels of Pentecost. By the way, we're moving from resurrection season on into Pentecost, just around the corner. And that is the great mission of the church begins there as the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself is poured out on the church from then on out the church begins to go out and do the very signs and activities of God. We are on a mission. We are people of mission, and we will continue that mission on until Christ's second coming. Not only are we people of mission, we are people of truth. It says that they devoted themselves, in our Acts passage, 
to the apostles' doctrine. You know, if you took all the sermons in the book of Acts and you boiled them down and what would be left over, you would find the life of Jesus in his signs and his wonders and his activities in his teaching. You'd find the death of Christ, the suffering and the death of Jesus. And then you'd find the resurrection of Jesus. And you'd find that he stands as judge and just, uh, the one who brings justice over all of the world as well. That preaching is repeated and repeated and repeated because those who enter on into the reality of God himself through Jesus Christ begin to set the world back to to the right place it's supposed to be in. That life, that death, and that resurrection is the truth that we convey throughout the world. And let me say this too. By having truth, truth isn't just something to kind of like have fun with and brush up on and and memorize a, a number of wonderful truths, which by the way, it's good to do that too. So let's be uh, uh, doing that. But as we look at the life of Jesus, this perfect individual, we can become more circumspect as well. We can broaden our horizons and confront unnecessary bias or prejudice or just ignorance that we have. Because when we look at Jesus, he looks right back at us and starts to work on those areas of our lives. We as a people of God have never been part of a community that says, you know what, just join us and you can just be the same forever. That's not the community that we've joined as God's people. God says, I welcome you as you are. In other words, you don't have to change in order to be part of this community. But once part of this community, God's word begins to affect its change within our lives. And we, as we compare our lives to truth, we grow and we mature. And that is the church That is the church's transformation process, to mature into the fullness of God in Christ himself. We can look more circumspectly. We are people of mission, but we are also people of truth. Let truth, by the way, challenge your very conceptions and your ideas, um, your preconceived ideas. That's what truth does, and what a celebration of community that we get to be a part of, that, that bi-directionally and multi-directionally, we can have a community. You know what I miss most, and maybe there's ways we can do this digitally more so, because there are ways, but I miss most having conversations about um, the content that we're all wrestling with through the scriptures. Very often after the sermon, people mention things, and they say things, and, and then we converse about it, and, and I've never needed like perfect agreement on every message that I've had. In fact, is I love community thinking through ideas together and, and voicing difference and, I, and, and, and challenging one another. And I think that's something that we as a Christian people can do so well, both digitally but definitely in person as well. Not only are we people of truth, we are people of fellowship. We are people that gather together And we will do that again. This church's motto is relationships are everything. The God that we serve is a God who came and lived physically among us in the middle of the germs, in the middle of the problems, in the middle of the injustice, in the middle of the prejudice and the bias. That is the God that we serve. He came and lived among us physically. He even died among us physically. One day, when all this is all said and done, the church will gather again. We are people that bring forth a fellowshipping community. And no disease will ever steal that away from us for good. That is the church of God. Some people have been reflecting, and I think it's good to reflect on this. I've been reflecting. How will the church change after all this is over? And let me be clear, there will be some moderate, minor changes, perhaps. I get the feeling, to have a humorous point, that the trustees may desire to meet online video from now on. The reason is, I think the average trustee board meeting is at least two hours, but the last one online was only one hour. (laughs) I get the feeling that's kind of exciting to get done with all of that business from your home very swiftly. And I am fine with those sorts of Uh, updates and innovations. But I also think that as much as we as a church can do better with our online presence and we as a church can do better reaching out through video, and that is a great reminder during this time, I also think it would be a crying shame 
to our forebears through 2,000 years of surviving through persecution and famine and sickness. And even after all of that, they still gather together again. That if the people of God would ever say that we are not going to gather again, we'll just find digital means alone to do so, I would challenge that. In fact, as I don't think it will be quite as dire as maybe some people might think, I remember reading um, an article back at seminary. We always had to read like three, four, five perspectives on every topic. And this particular topic was the economy. And the economy in reference to like 20 years ago or so, shortly after the Soviet Union fell, and they asked different Christian perspectives to be written in order to how can we shine Christ in the economy. And the two evangelical perspectives that I read before I got to the Lutheran perspective were like these almost pipe utopian dreams. I mean, I sat there as a young individual so excited, like, wow, we can toy with the mechanisms of the economy for Jesus. And I was getting excited about that vision. And then, of course, In other words, everything could change, and Christ would affect every last part of the Soviet Union's economy, which, granted, that'd be pretty darn awesome. But then I read the moderate Lutheran, and he says, I hate to be a stick in the mud on this one, and I really love my evangelical utopian dreamers over there, but I get the feeling after looking at history and the economic situations that our ability to tinker with this thing, unless we're directly within the realm of the economic... um, the economic changers, really won't be that dramatic. Now I was reading this 20 years after the events or more, and it was interesting that the moderate Lutheran was actually right. I love the dreaming, and we need dreaming. We always need to. But in the end, some things in the reference to the priorities and the soul of the church will always go back to. I think our Chinese brothers and sisters in Christ who have been meeting underground on and off for decades, decades, risking their lives because of an oppressive government, and they've found ways to gather again when it's safe for the well-being of them and their families, hoping that they wouldn't get caught too. I think they challenge us that when all of this is said and done, we must gather together. 2,000 years of plagues and diseases and famines, the church has come back together after it's all said and done. We are people of fellowship. We will come back together. Some of you might ask, well, how long is that going to be? You know what? I don't know. I'm not a prophet, and I'm okay with that. And I think this is a great time for personal and community transformation. And yet, nonetheless, whether it's one month, three months, six months, or 12 months, we're going to see each other again in Jesus' name. Not only are we people of community, are people of fellowship. I think it goes without saying that church people are people of food and people of drink. In fact, as I'm like yearning for some of the dishes and diverse food groups that all of you have brought to the tables over the years, we need to have a great feast when all is healthy again, which may be a while. That being said, I have been yearning to take communion together again with my family in Christ. It says they broke bread together in the book of Acts. Not only the fellowship meal, but also the meal of Christ where they raised the bread and they broke the bread and they shared it with one another as they shared in Christ's presence. I am yearning for the moment where the whole family is back together again, that we get to take part in bread and drink. We are people of bread and drink, of food and drink. And yes, for a season, there will be a pause on all of this. But then we will once again immerse ourselves in each other's backgrounds and cooking and fellowship to enjoy each other's presence physically once again. Not only are we people of food and drink, we are people of generosity. By the way, if you're in a difficult place you're out of a job or you've lost an income stream, make sure to protect whatever you have in front of you. And we encourage saving as a church. This is like one of the great biblical qualities, saving and being like the ant and putting away regularly, 
for the winters of life that come. But that being said, if that's not you in this time period, we still need to, dis- we still need to display generosity. We still need to find ways of supporting organizations for Jesus, which really are being affected in some ways. We still need to find ways of reaching out to our neighbor and offering them help if they have something in need. And by the way, we as a church, which we'll be sharing more about this in the weeks to come, have been so blessed to see individuals come forward and say they want to help others who've been affected. That is generosity. And you know, I know it's a difficult time, and I actually don't think it's going to pass away anytime soon. And nonetheless, how can we show love and generosity to those we're committed to in Christ? I'll tell you a little story. We moved into a, a new house recently, and uh, my neighbor comes over, and he offers us the lawnmower. He must have had a premonition that these people don't have a lawnmower. I wonder what it was. Maybe it was the long grass. I don't know. And so he brings his lawnmower over. Well, he doesn't bring it over. He just says that we can go on into his shed anytime and use it. Now, if you know me, I am not the best at asking for help. I'm not the best at, even when somebody's offered that, to take advantage of that, I don't know. I'm just weird, and I I don't always want to do that. And so I was just not going to borrow the lawnmower. Plus, I'm afraid of these things breaking and all the issues that that causes. Well, I'm out there picking up sticks in my yard, and he sees me. He comes on out, goes in his shed, gets the lawnmower, and brings it over directly to me and says, here you go. I want you to use this anytime you want. You never have to ask me. Just go in my shed. What an incredible act of kindness, by the way, for someone like me, especially that's a little more shy and receiving that help. And I thought, well, okay. You brought it over. I'll, I'll use it today. And, and we chatted, and he says, and by the way, don't worry about this. This thing's going to last me 20 more years. Why do you go out and spend some money right now in the middle of all this? Just use it. And I said, okay, that's really sweet of you. I will. A few hours later, I'm mowing the lawn. I get eight rows done with the lawn, and the lawnmower blows up, <laughs> literally. One hour later, it doesn't start. Two hours later, it doesn't start. Three hours later, it doesn't start. I brought it back. In the end, he was totally okay with that. But I should have known. 20 years, this thing will last me. It's like the Titanic story. Nothing can sink this, not even God. And then it sinks. Nothing will, this thing is going to last me 20 more years. And then it didn't. Eight more rows. In the end, he got it fixed. It wasn't a big deal, apparently. And he brought it back over and put it in my garage. What an act of generosity and love. And those things, when rightly done, sanitized and all, are great acts of compassion and love. And we need to be generous people. We are generous people. And that's what we need to continue to be. And not only are we people of generosity, we are people of prayer. I had a phone call early this week from one of the members of the prayer team. So in love with the Lord. So wanting to see God's people call out and cry out to the Lord. Are our people crying out? And by the way, here's these verses. And she began to bring forth verses from the Old Testament, the Exodus, about the people of God being required to call out to God and actually calling out and crying out, God, help us, we need your help. Where are you, Lord? And then she brought forth passages from the Psalms again and again and again and again crying out to the Lord in both celebration and yearning for his presence and in repentance. What a great season for us to reflect on our lives. Everybody, if you haven't been able to develop prayer habits yet, this is a great season to develop prayer habits. If you haven't been able to to take the time aside, many of us have been locked away. Not everybody, and I know there are some people that are more busy during this time, But many of us have had this season of waiting. Why don't we make it a season of waiting on the Lord and calling to the Lord and praying to the Lord and develop family patterns with the Lord of prayer? Think about it like this. Just just take a moment. Think about it like this. If you would pray five minutes a day, which by some standards and some Christian groups, that's not a whole lot, but let's start at five minutes a day. By the way, it can be a legitimate time. I'll leave that for you and the Lord to figure out. 
you would have accomplished by the end of one year over 1,800 minutes, 1,800 and more minutes of prayer by the end of the year. You know, in my daily time of prayer, at some glance I might think, you know, I need to do a whole lot more Every day, one, we could always feel that. But five minutes at the end of the year gets us 1,800 minutes ten, and more. Ten minutes by the end of the year is over 3,600 minutes. Twenty minutes, over 7,200 minutes a year. There has never been a better time to pray. Never been a better time to, to, to seek the Lord. Never been a better time to ask Him for wisdom. Never been a better time. We need to cry out to the Lord. We need to listen to that challenge to cry out to Him. And yes, we need to do it corporately, but in this time of separation, we need to do it privately. Let's be a praying people. We are to be a praying people. You want to know what makes the church have its priorities straight? You want to know what makes the church not lose its soul? Don't forget about missions then. We are people of missions. We are people of truth. We are people of fellowship. We are people of food and drink. We are people of generosity, and we are people of prayer. You know, if you ever took a look at Microsoft going back to that story, for a season they had dropped from being at the very top and had stumbled in a few directions, not entirely, but partially. But after researching out what its soul was and getting a sense of what makes Microsoft themselves and great, they have now revised and revitalized themselves to once again become the most valuable public traded company in the world. All that being said, it's also very clear that the church doesn't base its identity off the stock market like companies like Microsoft does. And by the way, thank God that our identity has never been found in things that this world finds identity in. Thank God that our soul is not determined by the ups and downs of the kingdoms that this world has. Our soul is determined by these measurements, how we're living the truth and in mission and in character and in sharing and in generosity and in prayer. I'm quite sure that even during this time, the church can advance the church can grow. Let's not lose our soul in this time. Amen.